Uh, we'll go ahead and start the uh, third plenary session of the meeting on the uh, 100 years of Beta K Spectrum. It was actually 100 years ago in 1914 that James uh, Chadwick, uh, working in uh, Hans Geiger's uh, laboratory, uh, published uh, the results uh, showing uh, the uh, continuous beta spectrum. And uh, since that time, of course, there have been an enormous number of uh, very interesting discoveries uh, using beta K, and I think what's really uh, relevant and interesting for this session is that normally something that was discovered a hundred years ago, you would still not see it on the leading edge of physics, but what we're going to hear today is that uh, we're seeing that beta K is still uh, being used to, uh, to, to look for physics beyond the standard model and to understand properties of neutrinos. So with that, I will i uh, ask the first speaker, uh, Hamish Robertson, who is going to talk to us about Beta K, a physics garden of earthly delights. Well, thank you very much, John. Good morning, everyone. It's, uh, Pleasure to be here. Um, I want to thank the organizing committee for the invitation to, to speak about the uh, first hundred years. And uh, I somewhat suspect that they uh, might have thought that I'd been around for the entire hundred years. <laughs> but uh, hopefully that's not the case. Uh, so my, uh, my metaphor uh, for, for uh, beta decay is this famous painting by Hieronymus Bosch in the early 16th century, uh, the, the Garden of Earthly Delights. And uh, certainly if you look at it, there, there's a, a lot of delights going on, which I won't get into. But uh, um, no matter where you look, there's something really bizarre happening. And uh, beta decay has sort of been like that. It's been endlessly fascinating, but everywhere we've looked, something bizarre has popped out and changed physics. And, a lot of the foundations of uh, nuclear and particle physics have originated from that um, uh, trying to understand and, and uh, absorb the bizarre twists and turns that have come from beta decay. So as John mentioned, uh, we credit uh, James Chadwick with the um, recognition that the beta spectrum was in fact continuous. Uh, in the interests of uh, historical precision, in fact, uh, it had been recognized earlier by a number of people. Becquerel himself in 1900 had done magnetic studies of beta decay using photographic emulsions. And unlike alphas, uh, all he could see were diffuse uh, bands. And he concluded that um, the beta spectrum appeared to be continuous. Uh, but at that time, of course, uh, Einstein was still five years away. Uh, he would tell us E equals mc squared. So in 1900, a continuous beta spectrum was not the kind of crisis that it soon became. Chadwick had enough experimental smarts to build a really good apparatus for the day and, and enough confidence to say, no matter what Einstein says, this spectrum is continuous. So he had traveled uh, uh, from Cambridge to Berlin to, to uh, make use of, of Geiger's uh, new counter, and he built a magnetic spectrometer. There's a source there which I believe was basically radium. Uh, most of that is... Uh, what we would now call bismuth 214 and lead 214. And uh, he magnetically analyzed the betas and got this spectrum. So curve B is what he got with the Geiger counter. And, and like a good scientist, he made a check using the old technique, which was to put a gold leaf electroscope here and take a very long time, make the same measurement, and it agrees very well. So he sees that there are lines here and also a continuous spectrum. And he had enough confidence in his results to say that, yes, this, this really is... Uh, um, a continuous spectrum. So it, he um, did not make it out of Berlin before the war started, and he was arrested and uh, put in the uh, internment camp in Spandau. Uh, it, it happened that uh, a young physics student by the name of Charles Drummond Ellis was also interned in the same camp, and they became friends, and uh, Chadwick convinced Ellis to become what we would now call a nuclear physicist. Uh, Ellis took up the, uh, the challenge. Um, the challenge was mostly coming from Lisa Meitner. Meitner did not believe in this. Um, 
and she made many objections, some of which were quite correct. Uh, this is not a, a pure source, it's a mixed source. Uh, the resolution is actually pretty good here, but maybe it isn't good enough. Uh, and, and for more than 15 years, she would not accept that the, uh, that the spectrum was continuous. Uh, it fell to Ellis, uh, Ellis and Worcester, to perform a really heroic calorimetric experiment where they showed that indeed energy is missing before Meitner would uh, finally capitulate uh, and agree. So the, the uh, spectrum uh, that, that was actually studied a lot because it's a pure beta spectrum, uh, although we now understand that it's actually a forbidden spectrum, was radium E. Uh, and uh, in 1930, shortly after the Ellis and Worcester uh, experimental triumph, uh, Pauli suggested that there was an unobserved particle, which he at the time called the neutron. Chadwick, of course, was busy off discovering what we now call the neutron at that time. He had kind of left Ellis and, and uh, um, uh, Worcester uh, to, to follow up on the beta decay problem. So uh, when uh, Pauli wrote his, his famous Dear Radioactive Ladies and Gentlemen letter, he was really speaking to uh, Meitner. There, there were not that many ladies in the business in those days. Within about three years, Fermi, uh, in fact probably two, uh, Fermi had worked out the theory of beta decay, making use of Pauli's suggestion of a neutrino. Um, Fermi uh, had been working on radiation at the time, electromagnetic radiation, and he was very fascinated by second quantization. And so he argued that the simplest possible Hamiltonian is, is what's shown there. Uh, there's some constant, which is just the strength of the interaction. There's an operator Q, which turns a proton to a neutron, or vice versa. And then there, is, uh, there are two field operators that create the electron and the neutrino. Uh, at the position of the nucleon. And as he pointed out in this paper, combinations of the field operators give five relativistic covariants, scalar, vector, tensor, pseudoscalar, and axial vector. So Fermi uh, wrote up his, uh, his work. He had intended to announce the results in a letter to Nature in, in November uh, of uh, 33, but the manuscript was rejected by its editor on the grounds that it contained abstract speculations too remote from physical reality to be of interest to its readers. Nature was a tough journal. So instead, he uh, sent it off to uh, a, a, a small Italian journal and a longer paper to Nuovo Cimento and, and Zeitschrift for Physique. Uh, and the consequence was that it, um, the paper was not available in English until about 1968. One of the uh, observations of this incredibly uh, insightful paper was that uh, he could tell that even from the limited data available, the mass of the neutrino must be rather small. Uh, we, hence, we conclude the rest mass of the neutrino is either zero or, in any case, very small in comparison to the mass of the electron. And he shows these three possibilities. So you, you recall that that looks somewhat like Chadwick's curve here, you know, equals zero. It wasn't long before many theorists adopted Fermi's beautiful arguments, um, and uh, among those was Beta, who realized that this was now a way to understand how energy was being made in the sun. He uh, uh, realized that there could be a capture process, uh, inverse beta decay, not, I'm sorry, uh, actual beta decay, where you capture uh, an electron on two protons. and. Uh, uh, he, he worked out uh, the, the, the theory of, of, the, uh, of two basic reaction chains, the CNO cycle and the PP cycles that, that drive the solar energy product, production. It had been known, Ed, Eddington had years ago, in 1920 roughly, had said it has to be nuclear energy. There's no other way to, to get enough energy. But it wasn't until Beta uh, made this insight using Fermi's theory that an explanation was available. But it's really interesting to look at that paper uh, because uh, Neutrinos are never mentioned. Uh, you notice this equation is H plus H goes to D plus positron. There's no neutrino. And, and nowhere in the paper. And in fact, in those days, I'm sure the neutrino was considered more a mathematical convenience than an actual particle. 
the, the Quarks uh, went through a similar phase after their initial proposition by Gelman and Zweig. But uh, the reality of neutrinos gradually uh, became more and more accepted. And finally, uh, in uh, 1956, uh, Rhinus and Cowan uh, detected the neutrino. Pauli had either lamented or perhaps gloated, I have created a particle that can never be detected. Uh, not so. Two rather talented experimentalists detected it using inverse beta decay. And this shows a picture uh, at the Hanford experiment, uh, Hanford reactor site uh, where they started work and they finally had complete victory at the Savannah River reactor not far from here. So the 50s were a time of tremendous uh, discovery in, in beta decay. Uh, on, only a, a year later, uh, C.S. Wu and, and her team discovered that uh, parity was violated following a suggestion by Li and Yang that it probably would be in the weak interaction. Uh, she oriented cobalt nuclei in a, a magnetic field at low temperatures, a somewhat heroic feat in those days to, to get to such a low temperature, and showed that the beta emission was asymmetric with respect to the spin. Notice the um, stopwatch there and the slide rule the good old days. And then uh, just a year later, um, Feynman and Gell-Mann developed the, uh, the, the, the theory of the Fermi interaction um, in what we still regard as the modern context. So they proposed that there was a, a chiral Lagrangian uh, inspired somewhat by Li and Yang's two component neutrino idea. In the theory, a vector, an axial vector interaction is intrinsic, although the relative sign is, is not determined. That has to be determined by experiment. And the vector current is like the electromagnetic current. The vector current, it's conserved. It's not renormalized in nuclei. And the final line here is, uh, it was actually mentioned by Oscar Navalat yesterday, uh, that um, Rustad and Ruby had done an experiment on helium-6, which clearly showed that um, the uh, the interaction was uh, tensor. Uh, the, the, you, one should read this paper. It's just a, a, an amazing uh, argument for how you have to be really careful if you're going to say something important. Um, the, this was a, a measurement of the recoil spectrum. Uh, it's actually the angle between the electron and, and the recoil. And this solid curve is the tensor interaction. Uh, the axial vector interaction looks like that. There's the tensor in another, uh, another energy range, and there's the axial vector. So, boy, there's no doubt from that data that it's tensor, but it's just wrong. And Feynman had enough confidence in his own theory to say, uh, th this experiment just can't be right. And sure enough, uh, within a few years, much better experiments had been done. And then another year, uh, in, no, actually in the same year, 1958, um, the helicity of the neutrino was measured by Goldhaber, Grazitz, and Sunyar. And uh, so we're going to go through this. Um, so fasten your seat belts. So you need a source and a detector. It has to be a source with spin uh, 0 to 1 to 0. And it has to be electron capture so that you only get a neutrino in the initial uh, step. You don't want to look at the source directly. Instead, you want to scatter the gamma rays from the nuclei to which this ends as the final state, samarium. Scatter the gamma rays resonantly into the detector at this energy. There's the gamma ray. This only works, however, if you figure out some strategy for making up the missing recoil energy. You can't just take a source and scatter it resonantly because you lose a little bit in recoil. Use the neutrino to do that. There's the resonant scattering picture. The neutrino is providing the additional kick that you need to bring this gamma ray back onto resonance. Now all you have to do is decide, since this is a zero to one to zero transition, which way is the gamma ray circularly polarized? Put, to figure that out, put in a slab of magnetized iron, flip the magnetization, measure the absorption, and you find the neutrino is left-handed. So this, I think, is, is to me, it's the most elegant experiment that's ever been done. It's just beautiful. And it's, uh, um, it was done in three weeks. 
few years later, uh, Ray Davis, perhaps um, uh, inspired by uh, Veda's uh, sliding of the neutrino, or, or maybe uh, confident that the neutrino was really there, decided that it was necessary to see if neutrinos were coming from the sun, from all the beta decays going on at the core of the sun. That's uh, Ray Davis and John Bacall. Uh, they built a, a very large detector, and for 30 years, Ray measured insufficient numbers of neutrinos. Uh, this is the beta decay spectrum from, from the sun. The chlorine-argon experiment uh, covers this range, and the theoretical prediction was up here, about a factor of three to four higher than what Ray was measuring here. And it wasn't until 2001 that this was sorted out by the SNOW experiment which showed that, uh, in fact, all the neutrinos really are there. Uh, if you measure, um, th this is a charge current reaction, which is all that, the, that Ray's experiment was sensitive to. Uh, but in fact, two thirds of the flux is coming in the form of other flavors, mu and tau neutrinos. And if you also look at elastic scattering, which has some sensitivity to the neutral current as well, you get very nice agreement between these three uh, different ways of measuring the neutrino fluxes. So let me now fast forward to, to modern times and ask the question, if you have a beta decaying nucleus, what can you measure? What is, what is accessible experimentally? What, could we, what can we look at? Well, we can look at the absolute rate, and of course the absolute rate is very important in nuclear physics because it tells us a lot about nuclear matrix elements, but if we are interested in, in the fundamental questions, we look at uh, typically allowed decays, and from that we get the UD, which is the largest element in the CKM matrix, and it gives us the, the Kibibo angle. We can look at the spectrum shape, and the spectrum shape gives us uh, information about the neutrino mass, uh, harking back to uh, Fermi's observation. It also gives us information about what is called Fierce interference, which is uh, a term that arises when you have, for example, a scalar admixture with a vector or a, a tensor admixture with the uh, uh, axial vector. And then you can look at correlation terms. Uh, for example, this is the, uh, for an unpolarized source, this is the electron neutrino correlation uh, with a constant A, which is characteristic of the interaction. Uh, there's this very nice uh, mnemonic, or I don't know what you'd call it, uh, just an ideogram for how, how to uh, sort out all the alphabet soup of these various correlations. The, uh, the two sides, or uh, the sides of this um, uh, uh, pyramid are uh, two uh, uh, double correlations, like, uh, like this one, um, the uh, electron-neutrino correlation or various uh, momentum spin correlations or spin-spin correlations. And the, the, the faces represent three um, uh, triple correlations, uh, which all turn out to be CP odd. So that was actually among the most interesting reasons for Jackson, Freeman, and Wilde developing the theory which we now use to study this in beta decay. So those are the things that we can learn. We can, we can measure all these correlations and we can look at the shapes and, and rates. It turns out that none of the non-standard model uh, things, non-V v minus A stuff has shown up uh, in, in these various measurements. Fortunately, although you start, if you take Fermi's five covariant interactions, you'd have 10 things, you know, uh, I'm sorry, uh, t uh, 20 things, because there's uh, um, am amplitudes and phases, but, uh, and they can be complex, of course. But there's really only six that dominate uh, for various reasons, and they're, they're listed here. There's a scalar, real parts of the scalar and tensor parts, and the, uh, real, uh, the imaginary parts of the scalar, tensor, and a possible right-handed component. These are CP odd, and, and this is CP even. So these two show up in that Fierce term, which you can find because it's got an energy dependence, or you can look at the correlations, and you can find evidence for these things. And, and these things would give you non-unitarity in the CKM matrix if they were there. So uh, this summarizes uh, the state of the art in measuring those various parameters that are most readily accessible. Um, you can do this at the LHC, and you can do it in beta decay. Generally speaking, beta decay still remains the most sensitive way to do this, uh, although there, uh, there are clearly advances available at the LHC. Um, this is all, I'm sorry, this is in percent, and, and this is an absolute axis. This shows where you could go, 
at, at 14 TV, um, the LHC is going to be very competitive with beta decay, but still there would be um, a, a wide range of uh, parameters that you could explore in, in beta decay that would be equally sensitive, if not more. But one area that has really been fruitful ha for uh, the study of beta decay has been building on the fact that the vector current is conserved and, and not renormalized in nuclei. If you study a pure vector transition, you can measure the basic strength of the interaction very well. There are small corrections which uh, are shown here, which are really, if you look at the scale, they're percent kind of corrections. And these are due to isospin breaking, that the overlap between the initial and final states is not quite perfect. The theory uh, of this is not completely un uncontroversial, but it looks pretty good. So the situation at the moment uh, looks very nice. The, um, uh, if you look at um, uh, uh, VUD uh, and, and VUS, which are the two major contributors to the unitarity constraint that is uh, explored here, uh, there's nice agreement, uh, and the fit agrees with unitarity. It wasn't always that way uh, until quite recently there was a problem. Um, right now it looks good. The sum is uh, one to uh, part in 10 to the fourth, or a few parts of 10 to the fourth, I guess that is. But uh, 10 years ago, it, it looked much worse. Uh, it would be natural to blame uh, nu nuclear physics for a problem because it's by far the lion's share of this sum. But it turned out that the problem was actually the smaller component, VUS. VUB is completely negligible. Uh, many experiments were done, particularly KTEV, that, that uh, revealed that there were problems with the old branching ratios in K on decay. Those were then sorted out, uh, and what was down here has now moved up to, to here, and beautiful agreement with unitarity. Now, if you want to go beyond the pure vector interaction, then uh, one very nice place to look is the neutron. So here, here's, uh, the, the, of course, the neutron spin a half. You get both vector uh, and axial vector components. And this is the vector part. How do we find the axial vector part? Well, it, at least in, in the neutron, the matrix element problem is not there, uh, and so uh, the axial vector part comes in uh, in this combination. Oh, that may be backwards. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. But anyway, you get an ellipse, um, which uh, uh, looks like that. Uh, and so the, the vector part is here, and you can also measure the uh, the ratio of, of the axial vector to the vector part by looking at some of these correlation terms, little a, big A, uh, B, big B. And, and when you do that, um, it looks all very nice uh, now, uh, although, I, as I say, this, this is fairly recent uh, development. There's the, um, the vector strength right there. This is from the zero plus to zero plus decays. The neutron lifetime, within this, there, there's still a little bit of chaos, uh, but uh, with a conservative error estimate, it looks like that. And then the correlation terms give you this blue band, so they all agree pretty well. But it would be very interesting to reduce these uncertainties to the point where you could actually uh, provide comparable precision to what is coming from the zero plus to zero plus decays without the nuclear physics uh, questions that might trouble you. This is just a summary from, from Jeff Nico on, on where we are on the unitarity tests. Still, by far, the, the most precise test is coming from the nuclear decays. Neutron decay isn't there yet. Uh, pion decay isn't there yet. And you can also do this with mirror transitions uh, by using correlations and, and the strength, just as you can with the neutron. Generally speaking, very nice agreement. Let me now turn to what I might call coming attractions. Uh, and I'll talk briefly. Uh, of course, I'm going to have to leave a lot of stuff out, but about neutrons and uh, helium-6 neutrino mass. So the neutron problem is being pursued very uh, aggressively with this complicated uh, magnetic spectrometer called NAB. Uh, this instrument is now being built and it will measure uh, little a, which is electron neutrino correlation, and little b, which is the Fierce interference term. So this is going to be a, a measurement at the 10th percent level, we hope. 
Yesterday we heard from uh, 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 Chen Yu Liu uh, about the, um, um, this instrument which is being used to trap ultra-cold neutrons and actually measure their decay just as you would measure the decay of any radioactive isotope. Uh, it consists of a, um, of a dish-shaped array of very small permanent magnets, a so-called Hallbach array. Uh, you bring in UCN from the uh, Los Alamos uh, Blue Hand Center, and uh, you have a, a, a guide field which is set up by the various coils around the outside which simply prevent the field from going to zero at any point. So a neutron that approaches these uh, little magnets sees a rapidly increasing field and it's repelled if it's a low field seeking state. And so uh, you then insert a vanadium sheet which is activated by the neutrons that are left and uh, do that at various times from the filling point and you get a, uh, a decay curve. Uh, I, I would have bet serious money that this would never work, but it works beautifully. It's just this lovely. Uh, and, and this uh, data actually agrees with the, the best value within the current uncertainties. There are almost are certainly some losses which haven't been accounted for yet, but uh, the fact that one can get this close uh, in, a, in a raw measurement is very impressive. Very exciting idea. You can go back and look at helium-6, which is a pure axial vector decay. Uh, there are several experiments that are going to do this. It's amazing that the old 1963 measurement from Oak Ridge is still the champ. No one has been able to uh, approach that in accuracy. But uh, just to um, a boost for the home team, the, the, um, the SENPA uh, facility is producing the, the most intense helium-6 uh, uh, source. All of this work is now done with uh, traps, either magneto-optical traps or ion traps. So that's so you can localize the, the helium-6 very precisely and then measure the, uh, uh, the recoil spectrum by time of flight. So let me now turn to neutrinos. The, the, the problem uh, post-oscillations that we must uh, try to address is uh, what is the absolute mass scale? Oscillations don't give us that. The, um, other question that we have to answer is whether the hierarchy is so-called normal, like this, or inverted, or whether it's something like this, which would be, I think, very strange, uh, the so-called quasi-degenerate situation, where essentially all these masses are the same with very small differences. Knowing this pattern is uh, of interest to, to particle physics. Uh, the cosmologists uh, would like to know and can also say something about the uh, absolute uh, mass, so one would like a number. Beta decay comes to the rescue here, as Fermi uh, said, and uh, this is just the same spectrum that you would have found in, in Fermi's paper, except that we modified it here to include the fact that we actually have three mass eigenstates, not just one. Uh, but the oscillation, since he's at as a square, the oscillation mass differences are uh, very small compared to the mass scale that we're looking at, and so it behaves very much as though you were still looking for a single massive electron neutrino. And so you look at the, uh, at the beta spectrum from tritium, and uh, there's the full spectrum, and you blow up the endpoint. Uh, what you're looking for is this little change as the neutrino goes from relativistic to non-relativistic. It uh, prevents the electron from taking the rest mass away with it. So if you can see the difference between these two spectra, then you can say something about the mass. So the Catron experiment, which I think must be the, the most ambitious beta decay experiment ever attempted, uh, is trying to push down on, on the current limit, which comes from tritium, which is about two electron volts. And so this is taking place in Karlsruhe, Germany, at a national lab, which is now the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. A big magnetic spectrometer, uh, a gaseous tritium source. The, the nice feature uh, of this method is that it's essentially model independent. Uh, you don't have to know anything about the nuclear physics to, to, to do this. So um, when you measure a neutrino mass in beta decay, you have an effective mass, as I mentioned, uh, which um, looks very much like uh, the mass of a single neutrino. And you can calculate this as just a weighted sum of the various mass eigenstates. Uh, 
Uh, and if you then plot that against the sum of the masses, which is perhaps what the cosmologists would like to know, uh, you see these two trajectories, one for the inverted and one for the normal, and they end at these dots. They, in other words, they can't go beyond that. Those are lower limits, lower bounds set by oscillations. So the present lab limit, the experimental limit, is out there at about 2 eV, and the Katrin experiment will go down uh, essentially an order of magnitude. Uh, data will start coming in in 2016, and uh, there are some reasons to believe that the, uh, the mass might be uh, accessible near the bottom of this range from cosmology. However, it is natural to ask, okay, supposing it isn't, um, what, what happens then? And there are three problems, which I won't go into in a lot of detail uh, on, which, which make it difficult to take a catron type experiment and push further down. There might be a factor of, uh, of almost two available. But basically, the experiment is as big as you can make it. I mean, once it gets to be the size of a town, uh, I think you're pretty much done. Um, unfortunately, also, the source won't accommodate more tritium because the electrons can't get out anymore. And finally, there is a broadening effect, an instrumental broadening, although it's really a fundamental physics origin, uh, wh which is caused by the molecular final states when you're looking at the decay of T2 uh, molecules. So th this is um, probably about as far as you can go with this technique. There's a new idea uh, which was proposed by uh, Ben Monreal and Joe Formaggio to use cyclotron radiation emitted by betas in a, in a uniform magnetic field. And this is a very nice idea because it allows you to, uh, to look at, the, uh, um, uh, at a very large source. And this just shows uh, work going on at the University of Washington on a prototype to check this out. This shows the, uh, the potential of this um, idea. It has all of the ingredients that you want to see in a preconceptual preproposal. It's both preliminary and optimistic. But I think it actually shows the potential of the method. So uh, what you're looking at, uh, well, on the right-hand axis is 90% uh, confidence level limit uh, for, the, for the neutrino mass. And on the horizontal axis is basically the size of the detector, how much tritium you're dealing with. So yeah, sorry, John. <laughs> OK. So if you can do an atomic experiment, which I think might be possible, uh, you, you might be able to reach 40 milli-electron volts. So this would take you down the next uh, almost an order of magnitude into the region where the inverted hierarchy is. So since I put the chairman's name on here, I know that he will uh, be, be OK with this. Um, this is just the limits over the years of the tritium beta decay. Uh, we're at 2 eV here. This is the Katrin level. Uh, it's somewhat uh, daunting to look at the extrapolation of this line and, and the year, but I, I think it will go faster than that. So that just shows the timelines for, for Katrin. Once it starts, data comes in fairly quickly at the beginning and then uh, it takes three, uh, three live years to reach the ultimate sensitivity of 0.2 electron volts. Project 8 is currently in this proof of concept phase and uh, it becomes um, fuzzy uh, without knowing further how well that idea is going to work. So let me just conclude by uh, also mentioning that beta decay is the is sort of the metronome by which all of the elements were made. And uh, with the EFRIB facility now under construction in Michigan State, simply four weeks ago it started, we will be able to explore the, almost the full span of our process nuclei and finally come to an understanding of how the elements that, that Chadwick uh, originally studied have come to be present in the universe. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Hamish, for a really uh, a delightful talk. Thank you. Uh, so we have time for a few questions. And if you have a question, please come to the, uh, the microphone that's uh, located in the center aisle. I can't see anybody. OK. Hamish, could you comment on whether the uh, WMAP or Planck results as extended will ever compete with the direct measurements? For the mass of the neutrinos and the sum of the masses. Ah, right. Um, yeah, actually, um, 
let me just show, um, there's a recent paper which uh, I think is, is somewhat interesting. This, this shows um, that, that there are tensions in, in the standard uh, Lambda CDM model which you can um, alleviate somewhat by introducing neutrino mass. Uh, this is a paper by uh, Batty and Moss, uh, I'm probably butchering his, his name there. But um, if you look at the lensing power spectrum, it's not really a great fit. Uh, both Planck and SPT find um, powers that are less than the uh, Lambda CDM model. And also uh, the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope lensing data uh, has a similar problem for galaxies. If you introduce a neutrino mass, uh, you can fix both of those. Uh, you, you do lose some other things by doing that. Uh, these, these people argue fairly persuasively that this is a better deal. So I, I think that the jury is out on uh, what, the, uh, what the mass uh, is from cosmology. And it, it's a reminder that um, we, we always uh, are, are really dealing with observations rather than measurements when we're trying to derive something like this. I prefer measurements. Any other questions? Okay, well, if not, let's uh, thank Hamish again for a very nice talk. Thank you.